Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, welcome to our new sermon series, Prophesying Justice in an Unjust World. Things aren't always the way they should be, right? Like, (laughs) they're not always the way you plan for them, either. But they should be a certain way, right? Things the world should be a particular way. And we all kind of know that when when something goes wrong and we feel uh, wronged or we feel like something's unfair, we we feel that and we're frustrated by that. Uh, Justice is, is really just another word for saying the way things should be, the way life ought to be. And one of the main themes of our November Bible readings is going to be justice based on the prophets. Now, justice is important, and it doesn't matter whether you're a Christian or not. It's important for society in order to be able to function well. Um, we, need, um, we need things to be fair because when things start to get unfair, um, that's when people start to... Uh, Ignore the rules, right? Without rules, people tend to do what seems best in their own eyes. And without some follow-through to ensure that the justice is actually carried out, people will, many people, maybe all of us, will get away basically with whatever we can get away with. We need that carrot, that proverbial carrot and that stick to encourage good behavior and, and to punish bad behavior. So I guess what I'm getting at is justice is not limited to simply the right and wrong rules. It includes some follow-through. It includes ensuring that when justice is perverted, things get fixed, and there's consequences to the offenders. Now, unfortunately, in Amos' day, in the northern kingdom, whom Amos was prophesying primarily to, the northern kingdom had failed miserably. The king's were unfaithful. Oh, they might have had some military and political success. They had got stuff done, but in God's book that didn't matter nearly as much as how faithful they were to the covenant. The problem was the people in Israel in Amos' day thought that they wanted God to return to their nation because they assumed that as Israelites that he was already on their side. Right? They, they felt pretty blessed at this particular point in time. The people of the northern kingdom were living fat off the land when Amos writes to them. Their barns were full. Life was pretty good. They'd experienced some military success, and uh, things were going well. Unfortunately, uh, the rich were getting richer, and the poor were getting poorer. There was rank corruption and all kinds of false worship, and just plain out, outright idolatry celebrated even up to the highest level of government. The people in Amos' day, right, they saw themselves as God's people, but they were only fooling themselves. They spoke as if they wanted God to be present with them, to return to them. Many of them even went to the temple, although, right, it was technically the wrong temple It was a temple of Bethel that God had never sanctioned or given the okay for, right? But we're we're all worshiping the same God, right? I mean, it doesn't matter how you do it, does it? Well, turns out it does. It does matter. You can't just invoke my name, says the Lord, and then do whatever you want. You can't just ignore all the instructions I've given to you and then Say my name as if that's a stamp of approval on whatever you say. No. In fact, the Lord says in our reading, I despise your religious feasts and festivals. I hate your sacrifices and your your songs, your harps, your worship. They just hurt my ears. Israel was full of pious feeling and self-righteousness, but they lacked all humility, and any real awe or fear of Yahweh. 
And that's why Amos says, Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. Why would you want the day of the Lord? It is darkness and not light. When the day of the Lord comes, it will be as if you were escaping from a mountain lion, but run into a gruesome end at the hands of a bear. It will be like you go into your house thinking that you can relax and you lean up against the wall, but only to have a poisonous serpent bite you. You think that God's return will be your salvation, but it will be your undoing, says the Lord of hosts. You see, not only have they mistreated the vulnerable and committed idolatries, but the kingdom of Israel had ignored all of God's warnings and rebukes as well. It's not like, he says in the book of Amos, it's not like this is the first time I'm saying something to you guys. It's not like I didn't give you warnings. He sent them calamities. He said, just like I'd, set, just like I'd said I would if you didn't obey my laws. Remember all the same kinds of things I did to the Egyptians when I brought you up out of Egypt? I sent you the same kinds of calamities and I told you I was going to, and I told you what they were for, you'd have, I'd have thought you'd have gotten the hint, but they hadn't. Then Yahweh starts sending prophets like Amos, who told the leadership of the nation what they should have already known, that their actions were a stench in God's nostrils, and that he would punish them if they didn't shape up. But even when God sent punishments, even when he sent them prophets, even when he predicted ahead of time, it didn't cause any change of heart among the northern kingdom. And so Amos said, this phrase that's become rather famous, let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Amos is talking about cleansing the land, right? That's what water does, especially rushing water, hard-flowing water. Um, and he's saying, I'm going to cleanse the land and I'm going to purify it. I'm going to make it completely clean. And if I have to wash you away with the other filth because you won't repent, well then, so be it. And that's a good, if slightly frightening, reminder to us that don't assume just because you identify as a Christian that God is automatically on your side. We too can sometimes be full of pious feelings and and believe that it's our right to have God accompany us and do what we want. We might honor God with our lips, but at times our hearts are far from him. It's easier to ignore things like justice or not care about right and wrong and instead just lose ourselves in entertainment or self-gratification. Sometimes we say all the right things. We perhaps we even come to church, but we forget that the things that we're doing are life itself, and, and they become simply rituals or words. We don't think about what we're singing or actually give praise to God. They're just words on a screen. We don't listen to the scripture reading or the message. We just kind of let them roll on over us. What, what we need to do is exactly the same thing that Amos was calling on the people of the northern kingdom to do. Amos's message and his take-home point throughout his book is simple. Repent. Instead of just going through the motions or the right words, we need to repent. We need to address the wickedness in this world instead of just being caught up, living it up. We need to return to the words and instructions of our God. We need justice in part because sometimes we practice injustice in our own thoughts, words, and deeds. Uh, today's focus, and each week as we focus on justice, we're going to be focusing on a slightly different aspect of it, and today we're focusing on timing. Um, waiting is very important when it comes to justice and getting things right. I mean, investigations, for instance, can be, cannot be rushed through all the time. And, and snap judgments, uh, oftentimes they make things worse, not better, which is why sometimes we have to let due process uh, take its course. But we all, I think, have a bit of a problem with timing and justice, and that's pretty simple, really. We don't want to wait. When it comes to justice, we don't want to wait. 
for the investigation to take place. We want results now. We don't want to know what's really happened. We don't want to look into, the, look into it or try to sort through what's right and wrong. We don't want to wait for the long process of fixing a serious issue, you know, such as racism or education. We just want it fixed already yesterday. Or if we don't want to wait, or perhaps we don't feel like wading through all the junk and the, and the headaches that it might take to get there, we might just throw our hands up and abandon the idea of justice altogether. But the truth is, sometimes we have to wait, and sometimes we also have to be willing to work for justice. Um, on the one hand, I think it's kind of foolish to ignore um, the realities of sin, to pretend that justice in our world will just kind of happen automatically, uh, as if you could trust the world to do what was right without any sort of correction or guidance. Right? I don't think that works in any of in our lives, <laughs> doesn't work with uh, when raising kids or managing an office space or teaching kids in a classroom. There's got to be correction and guidance or things are going to go to pot pretty quick. Well, so too, in, in the world around us, we can't just wait for other people to fix everything. If we want good, we've got to do good sometimes. Humanities, I think as Lutherans we could say, humanity's default mode tends to be sinners and selfishness. And so we've got to actively fight against evil, starting, of course, with ourselves. The church is called, as Ezekiel was called, to be a watchman, to sometimes call a spade a spade, whether it's popular or not. We have to try and make this world a better place, whether it makes people around us uncomfortable or not. Yet, many times, we also have to wait for God's justice. And, and yes, um, sometimes it takes wisdom and maybe experience, the Holy Spirit and prayer, to figure out the difference, right? There's no simple answer I can give you about when it's time to wait and when it's time to do something. You know, that's part of wrestling with life, I think, is that we have to, you know, we, we have to really consider things and wait for God's help. And, um, and that's how we can navigate our way through um, it, well, it's not always simple answers, but there is a time, there's a season for everything, a time to wait and a time to act. And if you get that figured out, boy, you're, you're doing pretty good. Um, but it's also important in the big picture to know that we do sometimes have to wait. Sometimes we have to wait for God to really, truly, and completely fix a situation or fix a problem in this world. There are times when we certainly would like to do things forcefully, but instead there, we must sometimes trust in the Lord to fix things. He's promised that he will, after all. This world can be a real mess, a real tangled, jumbled knot, and at times God's the only one who can really untangle it and fix it. Um, and thankfully, uh, when we listen to Amos and repent, we, we don't have to worry about being on the wrong end of God's justice as we listen to our lesson from Thessalonians, Paul talking to the Thessalonians. He encourages us that we are not like others who have no hope because we have Christ our Lord and because we have His commands. His commands to do the same thing that Amos said, which is to repent, but also to believe. And to see that as we repent, that God has sent His Son, Jesus, to redeem us, to forgive us, uh, to shelter us. We can kneel at the foot of the cross because through the cross, Jesus provides us protection from the wrath of God. Wrath that we otherwise would deserve, that we've earned, not accidentally, but by mistreating the world around us, by doing wickedness and injustice when we ought to have done what is right, by being faithless, by not listening when God spoke to us. But God, it turns out, although He punishes when necessary, is not looking to punish us. Rather, He's looking to redeem and restore us. And so, since God wants to save us, but He also wants a good world, and, and He knows that that 
can't happen, it won't happen through legislation or commands or even government, but through changed hearts, through Christ our Lord. And so that's why he sent his only begotten son, so that instead of simply being punished, we might be changed and redeemed. His power and commitment to justice and making this world good and healthy, combined with his uh, amazing grace, are what make us uh, what make us know that we can rely on the Lord. We can, we can wait for the Lord. We may not want to. We may wish things would be fixed now, but we can trust Him and wait for Him to complete things on the day of our Lord's return when He will make all things new, including our hearts and minds and bodies. We wait for the return of the Lord because He alone can truly fix what needs fixing in this world. In Jesus' name, amen.